Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, Greg Anthony here, and glad you are back on the Investigative Journal on this Tuesday, June 13th, 2017 day on our calendar. Yesterday, I recounted my involvement in the mainstream media for many years, then moving over to the alternative media on Republic Broadcasting Network, as well as Genesis, and then moving into my own show, which has been dubbed the alternative to the alternative media. So I guess if I keep going, it'll be the alternative to the alternative to the alternative until there's no more alternatives. However, what it boils down to is I've given myself, you know, I've I've done this for this show for over a decade. And uh, I said yesterday that I was contemplating whether to put an end to it. And I received a couple good emails, uh, giving me some encouragement, but it boils down to this. We have to think of a way to get this show funded because it's listener funded. So I want you to go directly to my website, arcticbeacon.com, and there's a donate button there to go directly to me. Now, if you go to First Amendment Radio, it goes to the radio. Now, I'm not saying don't go there. They deserve to be, you know, supported as well, but... uh If I don't get some donations directly, then they'll just put on some other broadcaster and that show, their radio station will go on. So I'm appealing to you and I'm going to take a few days to decide uh, what I'm doing. However, and, uh, you know, both sides are good. Uh, Sure, there's a lot to discuss, a lot to talk about. But yet there's more voices out there. I'm not the only one that speaks on this. And secondly, I've done this a long, long time. And... uh, you know, sometimes you have to uh, really reassess things and say, okay, maybe enough is enough. Well, I'll keep you abreast on what I finally decide. And uh, like I said, again, go to uh, Arctic, A-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N.com and uh, lend me a hand because this is listener sponsored. And you cannot get advertisers ever to, you know, get onto the truth regarding really what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the new, the Illuminati and then talking about just the builder burgers and, you know, every secret society known to man. I'm talking about bringing the spiritual and the secular together in this quest for a one world government and a one world religion. So to do that, they have to have the major governments involved, all of the leaders whether they appear on the surface to be fighting against each other, as well as they have to have the Pope at the top of the chain here to kind of put in the final nail in the coffin to Christianity, Judaism, and anyone who doesn't want to support the Vatican. Now, over the years, I've covered more genocides than I would like to admit. It's incredible when you start really looking into this, starting out way, way, way back when with the Albigenses and others during that period of time, way back when. But as you move through history, the Vatican's been involved in most every one of these things. And people say, well, that ended with the Crusades and all that kind of stuff. And in fact, the Crusades were justified, right? That's what they'll tell you. But no, it hasn't ended. What about the Protestant Reformation? That never gets discussed, does it? Even in Protestant churches. Why don't you go into a Protestant church in America? You know, one of these traditional ones, Episcopalian, uh, Lutheran, whatever you want to uh, call it, and say this to them. Could you please explain to me the Vatican role in the killing of Protestants? And did you ever read the Book of Martyrs? by Fox, uh, what's it, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and all these books that tell you the, the the stories that are just so incredible. And then ask them some really specific questions. Do you, do you ask if they know what a red mass is and why a red mass on the opening of the Supreme Court is the traditional way 
to open up our Supreme Court. And all of these leaders, whatever denomination they are, whether they're Jewish, I'm talking about presidents, all the Supreme Court justices, they all go to a Catholic mass called the Red Mass. Now, I'm going to let you do your homework here. I'm not going to tell you the name, but it's dedicated, and this started in uh, with John Paul II. It's dedicated to someone in England who was responsible for our beheading Protestants. Yes, that's what they go, that's what it's dedicated to. He was, of course, in the legal profession, but his side job was lopping off the heads of Protestants. But that's what they go and do. Ask them that. I mean, you could go on and on and on. I once did a show called 10 Questions You Need You Ask Your Protestant Minister to realize, to see if he's on the level or if he's just another Vatican follower calling himself a Protestant, which is really what's going on today. And remember the story I did about Billy Graham. And there's a number of good books out there. Billy Graham was a 33-degree Mason. He was in the pocket of the Pope as well. And so you go on and on and on. And these genocides, boy, are troubling. Now, what I want to do today is talk about one of them, one that you may have not heard of. Oh, that never gets glossed over. It always gets glossed over. And it only happened in the 90s. Oh, but that, to Americans, is such a long time ago. Because now, what are they worried about? All of them are calling for Trump's, oh, we got to get rid of Donald Trump. We can't, we can't stand it. And then all the right-wing people are saying, oh, we got to get rid of these left-wing radicals, these snowflakes. And this kind of, this kind of nonsense is what takes over the media. Everyone's in this. And you know what they're doing? They're pitting America, a civil little civil war here. What they're doing is trying to bring people. I mean, I've never seen, uh, just recently, Sunday, there were rallies, anti-Sharia law, ra- you know, law rallies, and then the pro-Shia law people were there, and they got into fights, and this was going on in 23 states and cities all over our countries. Don't you think these are staged? Now, let me tell you the group. I grew up in, a, first I was born in Chicago, and I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. And I bet you if I go back to that beautiful state, most of these people could care less about this. But they're getting sucked in to this political circus that's going on. That's just ridiculous. And I'll have to do a show down the road pinpointing why I think Trump was selected to take over the reins, and why he has changed the political scenario to America first when Obama was putting Iran first, and how this really works to the benefit of the New World Order. Because you see, you tear down America, now you build it up and you create havoc overseas, and you got all these people pointing missiles at us now, and uh, maybe they want a big conflow how do you say that word, conflagration? I can never say that word. There's always words you can't pronounce, even though you've been speaking this language for how many decades, Greg? But anyway, listen, you can't get caught up in that. It is so obvious, but it's obvious to people who really do their homework. I mean, this is amazing how America right now is at the precipice of what I consider to be a complete and total changeover of the way people are going to live, the way they think, you know, in fact, the way people think now, the majority of young people, I'm telling you this, this internet is good for a few things, but I'm going to tell you why it's not good for the Rwanda genocide and who was really behind it. So let's talk about another genocide the Vatican was involved with. I've reported on this many, many years ago. And in fact, I've had eyewitnesses. I've had, I've had attorneys on my show who are involved in, in trying to get to the truth behind really what went on in Rwanda. But many people here said, ah, it's so far away. And anyway, who cares about the African people? They're all starving to death anyway. But do you realize the Vatican was involved? Now, there's a video I'm going to play. It's about 22 minutes because I look for these things. And the reason I do is it really talks about the Vatican's role in Rwanda genocide. Now, it was put up. Let's see. What was it put up? It was put up February 3rd, 2017. So that's going on, what, five months? You know how many views it's got? 26. 
Yes. Do you know how many followers Donald Trump has on his Twitter account? 100 million. Do you know how many hits there were on Alex Jones meeting with Megyn Kelly, two New World Order shells? Millions. I can go on and on and on. It's usually the, here's what, nine things that could happen if Trump builds the wall. 4.2 million people. But the Rwanda genocide in the Vatican gets 26 views in five months. Now let me tell you why I think it gets views. Because I think there's a law, algorithm that's set up to block shows like, block videos with this, these types of headlines. Because I find that the some of the better videos and some of the better articles done on this subject and other genocides and other subjects of Vatican Jesuit involvement get none, get very few. But if you, if Alex Jones did something, he would get millions. And it would be a frivolous thing. Because, look, they want you to go down those rabbit holes. They don't want you to get to the truth. They want you, you know what? Somebody sent me an email regarding uh, my show. Let me read it to you. I was on one of my videos that, but, oh, by the way, First Amendment puts out my videos, and they ask for donations there. I don't say don't do it, but if you want to donate directly to me, at also, then split it half and half. I don't care. Uh, go to arcticbeacon.com. And I'm trying to keep this show on the air on First Amendment. I may have to start another blog to keep this one. Isn't that funny? I got to do another show to keep this show on the air, and let's see how that goes. Now, this this guy put it pretty good. He said, "Mr. Anthony, you put Alex Jones and all his gibberish to shame. I hope people step up to support your efforts. So do I. I'm thank you, Mark. Secondly, you are a gifted journalist. Well, I don't know about that, but anyway, he thinks so. I really believe you could have ascended far up the ladder in the in the mainstream media had you sold out." Oh, don't tell, you know, tell me this. Yes. And that started a long time ago in my first job in the Naples Daily News that I was fired from. And the reason was, is I had a story that was about the bad water going into the subdivision. This was back in the late, in the year 70, you know, in the seven, late 70s. And the story never got published. And I went to my editor and I said, why? And he said, well, it's just not documented well enough. I said, really? Well, anyway, guess what happened? I said, well, you know what? Maybe one of the TV stations would want it. So I went to start peddling it around to ABC and all these stations, and they were about ready to do it. In fact, guess what happens? The publisher got wind of it, called me into his office, and fired me. Yes. He said, you work for us, not ABC. What are you doing going trying to get this story? I've got somebody called me from ABC, the local affiliate there. Are you fired? I said, okay, fine. <laughs> so guess what? I find out the publisher had money involved in that subdivision. Guess why I was fired? So guess what happens? And I'm going to tell you the truth. This is I was a young kid, first journalism job, and in fact, uh, I was in Naples, Florida. I didn't know what the hell to do. So I started applying for jobs, and I applied for a job at the Nashville Banner, the big paper and also a job in Michigan at the Oakland Press. Now, granted, the Nashville job paid twice as much. No, the, Nash the Michigan job paid twice as much because they pay more in the north than in the south, and I guess that's because of the Civil War or something. I've never really understood why. But anyway, I go up there. I'm driving through, and I meet the editor, and um, I figure, well, I'll go. And guess what I did? I was frightened to tell him the truth. So I said, oh, I was on vacation. I want to get a better job. And really, I lied to him. And I, I admit I had, I was, I didn't know what to do. I want, I had a job, didn't have much money. Journalists didn't make much. I was making what, 175 bucks a week. Uh, so anyway, I, guess what? He hires me on the big Nashville paper. I'm going, and he says, you'll have to work nights. Well, just before I got out of my hotel, they called me into the office. I said, oh, good. They called me in to see how I was going to do, what my job was. They said, Greg, you know, we're going to have to rescind that offer. I said, why? Well, one of our journalists here knew one of the journalists 
in Naples, and they were kind of, he was kind of, you know, one of these screwball journalists who got involved in my business, you know. He could have just said he didn't care that I didn't have a job and that I was, he was twice as old as me. I was 21, 21 years old. I realized I made a mistake, but I figured once I got in there and they knew I could write, you know, I could tell them, hey, I got, I tell them the truth. And what, you know, water under the bridge, so to speak. So this journalist gets his nose involved in my business and they say, Greg, we can't hire you because you didn't tell us the truth. I said, well, listen, I, this is why. They wouldn't budge. And I said, good for you. And guess what? I'm looking back on it now. And how many lies has that paper told? <laughs> they're still telling lies to you. And they're worried about me telling a little lie. Maybe they were worried that I would tell the truth. Who knows? Well, anyway, it worked out better. I got hired at the Michigan paper, and I made twice as much money, and the rest... I went on to Rome, etc. But anyway, yes, I did. So he says, you would have went far up the ladder uh, in the mainstream. And I probably could. And if I didn't go to Rome, I probably would have because I realized what the Vatican was all about. And so guess what? I couldn't go back. I had to make a decision. I think they wouldn't let me write about it there. So I'm going to come, when I came back to the States after seven years, I, what was I going to do? Yeah, I could have sold out, forget about it. But I decided, no, no, I'm not going to work. I can't do this anymore. I have to do something else. So I ended up getting back, uh, doing a number of different things, getting a law degree. Then I went back and I said, God, 9-11 came. It's time to get to the truth. And I did. And that's how I got to the alternative media, which I found out, like I said yesterday on my show, was all screwy. And all, most of it, the Jones and that whole crew, Genesis, Republic, all shills, all controlled opposition. And I learned that firsthand, just like I learned about the Vatican firsthand. But listen, yeah, I could have made more money if I sold out. I'm sure I could have handled a job with uh, any of those big papers or even on, you know, one of those cable networks that were starting up, but I didn't. And then even I was making a lot more money when I wasn't talking about the Vatican very much until I started when I was on the uh, Republic Broadcasting Network in Genesis with thousands and thousands of listeners, and I could put on, then I, the only place I had to go was a Christian station. And uh, that goes well for a while, then bad, well, bad. And finally now I'm at a precipice where I have to decide uh, if I can keep this going. Not getting any younger either. Now he goes on. I would like to just remind you, Greg, you to be thankful to God for all he has given. He has you. You are far richer than you realize. I think he doesn't mean my bank of book, because I know what's in there. Thank you for all your efforts. I will start giving when my new job starts. Jesus Christ, be magnified. Good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Okay. So, if bad ones come in, I'll read those too. Well, anyway, I got through about almost the first half hour. Why don't we start this? You know... And I, I'll be honest with you, I screened part of it, but I trust uh, trust this guy. I can't believe 26 views. 26 views. And uh, let's see what he has to say. The dogs are busy here right now. Those are not mine. I've got, oh, I should report. And why don't I do this? I've, I'm uh, living near a bunch of dogs that are not mine. And occasionally they bark. I like that. You know, it would bother some people. I don't particularly mind it. But anyway, I lost to my favor, one of my favorite. I had two dogs, Miss Moose. She died in January. And just about a month and a half ago, my dog Max uh, started limping. And so I went. it got worse and worse. And I took an x-ray in uh, California. And the results where the, the vet came back and said, "Why? Well, I, I don't like the look of this leg, the bone. So they were scaring me with bone cancer, which there's still a possibility, or possibly an inflammation of the bone. So we put him, Max, on, and Max is 10. In fact, he was in the movies. And a very, you know, he's one of my favorite dogs. In fact, today at lunch, uh, a bunch of girls, all the waitresses, were taking pictures of him. And, uh, boy, he got more attention than I did. But, anyway, that's typical for the last 10 years. So, anyway, uh, I finally decide that I cannot afford these vets 
in California. I mean, every time I was gone there, it was 300 bucks. And now it was going to get into the thousands. So I moved primarily to Mexico. One, because it's good to get out of America for a while. I lived out of this country for seven years. And for seven years, folks, I did not watch American TV. And it gets addictive, so now I'm not watching it. So anyway, I went to one of the best vets here. And boy, the price was so reasonable. I mean, now here's what he said. So Max gets in there. The vet, I'm doing this to show you the differences. And I'm sure you can get better medical treatments in certain areas here in Mexico for humans as well. Uh, well, anyway, my vet, I like my vet, but he didn't do the same test. This vet took my, took Max and his, his right leg is still limping. He's been on an anti-inflammatory and he still has that limp. He was with me all day today in the car as we were driving around trying to find our way through the town which is interesting how they drive here. I'm going to do some shows on living in Mexico. Maybe I'll start a blog. What about that? Maybe I could raise some, uh, what do you think? People listening, a blog on how to live in Mexico and enjoy it. I had a good lunch. Listen to this. Three of the best tacos you'll ever taste. Waited on like a king, and each taco was 85 cents. Now, in America, that would have been like, uh, what, are you going to go get lousy tacos at Taco Bell? Or you go to a nice place, cost you $8, $10. All right, so advantages, cheaper living, and uh, but earning money here in Mexico isn't easy, so you got to find something online to keep it going, right? So here's the deal. So Max uh, is in with the vet. He starts moving his leg and pushes, and he yelps, and it's up in his shoulder, right shoulder. So we do a big x-ray, and he comes back and looks, and it's cloudy there, and he says, you know, I don't like the look of that. So the parameters are this. It's either a possibility of bone cancer, which is not pretty, or it could be an inflammation of the bone. We put him on some a stronger medicine now. We're going to see how it goes for two weeks. And uh, one nice thing about it, the bone on the x-ray from the Chula Vista doctor, uh, it seemed down in the radius, down lower, it was he it looked better. So they're, you know, I'm still not hoping for the best. But you have to deal with life as it comes, right? So anyway, we got him on a stronger, uh, now strong, not an anti-inflammatory, uh, another, the reverse of that to see how he reacts. And if he's better in a couple of weeks, then, you know, we'll keep going. But if not, there's an opportunity to do a biopsy, which I don't know what I'm going to do, but I have a feeling now I'm going to start looking for some alternative cures. And the interesting thing is when you give this type of medication, you got to get off of the anti-inflammatories. So we're gonna, I'm going to be looking at that. So say a prayer for him. And uh, that's what I'm dealing with with Max. And it's so much cheaper here. And I wanted to be able to take care of him in, uh, during this. And I couldn't do it in America. Just too expensive. Took up everything at the end there. Uh, and, you know, when you have somebody like that, just like a child, You'll spend, you know, you'll go to extremes and uh, so who are here. And in fact, it's good change. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But since I ate up this whole half hour, let's uh, get to the Rwanda genocide. And this poor guy who did a, I, at least the part I listened to was pretty good on this Rwanda genocide and the Vatican's role. And it got 26 views in five months. They've got to be blocking some of this stuff. I think the more truthful it is, the more they block it. You know, what do you think? Because I've had people tell me that. You know, I'd say, God, I did the same video on this subject, and then I look at another guy who's a shill, and he gets like 20 million, and I get like 300. No wonder, you know, how are you going to, you know, well, no wonder Alex Jones makes millions of telling all these lies and being a shill, and maybe he's Bill Hicks. I, I'll tell you what. Some guys did some good stuff on that. I don't really care who he is, but I know what he is. And that's the important thing. So back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. 
There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org the following program is labeled dangerous and off limits by the supreme jesuit command but stand tall people listen up and you may just learn something Yes, we are back for the second half hour, and I have to correct an error that I made. At the outset of the show, I said it is June 13th, Tuesday, 2017. Boy, I moved to Mexico, and my days are mixed up. It's actually June 14th, but I did get the day right Tuesday, so forgive me. Uh, what I want to do is get, yeah, we have to get back to this uh genocide, the Vatican's role in the Rwanda genocide in the 90s. So let's get back and see what. He calls himself the follower of Christ, and let's see what he has to say about the Vatican's role in Rwanda. Wait, when, one thing. It's about a 22 minutes, so I've got about a minute and a half here. I did want to say one thing. One interesting thing here, since we're talking about dogs, there's many, many strays in the, the town that I live in. And uh, 
there was a couple of interesting ones today that really seem to navigate the area well. They come over, they look very well fed. So uh, perhaps they know exactly. In fact, they this one hung near a fish uh, place that I was eating at, and was getting some uh, scraps. And they said, and I asked the waitress. I said, "Boy, these two dogs are interesting." And my dog was sitting there with me. Max was with us, and the other two were sitting out there, and they were very, very hospitable and friendly. They didn't bark. And they, I said, "Boy, they look pretty fed." And they said, "Yeah, the owner of the restaurant feeds them every day." takes care of them, and then they go and they play over there by the beach. And so at least those dogs are getting taken care of. But there are a number of ones I see on the street that look quite thin. And uh, I know there's one rescue place here, but I may look into that and see uh, see what the situation is. Interesting. Okay, but anyway, there's no dog catchers, I found out. Thank God. Boy, I remember when I was in the park. This is the difference. I was in the park in... You know, San Diego, near Chula Vista, near the ocean. And this one lady had a little duck sound. And she let it off the leash. And it just strayed maybe 30, 20 feet away. And this, they, every now and then the dog catcher comes by. And this lady gets out and yells at the lady and said, if you don't put that dog in a leash, it's a $50 fine. I mean, it was a small little duck sound. Give me a break. All right. And you do you know in California there's a leash law? Get this. Or maybe it's San Diego. I know it's in San Diego because when I was in a park walking Max and Moose a long time ago and I had my, when I was living uh, near that park, uh, one dog got loose and then the, they started to patrol the area and they were going by measuring people's leashes. And they said anybody with those expandable leashes is use, is against the, expandable leashes are against the law. That's what they said. But everybody has them. But they said, then they started measuring. They, me In fact, measured my leash. And they said if it was longer than six feet, I would get fined. It was actually six feet. My other one was four feet. Can you believe that? Do they have better things to do? But it's America, all right. Boy, though, they think of every law under the book. Okay, let's get to Vatican's role in the Rwanda genocide. Here we go. Here we go. Some music, action, camera. What makes the genocide in Rwanda so unique is that the regime succeeded to convince the general public to kill. I'm looking at our, our thousands of skulls. How could villagers kill their neighbors? Cracked skulls. There's one looking right and at how me. Could Amazing. It be done with the blessings of the nation's bishops, and even with the support from European Catholicism and Christian Democrats. The Christian Democratic International CDI supported the regime before, during, and mm -hmm. after the genocide. Rwanda has had a long and usually strong bond to Christianity. Missionaries started the Belgian colonization. Belgium gave the church authority to handle the administration. Okay, there Belgium we go. Belgium gave the church authority to handle the administration. I thought there was a problem. So the state gave power to the Roman Catholic Church. The Vatican focused on Rwanda because it was such fertile ground for Christianity. The people were monotheistic, and the kingdom already had a well-functioning central administration. Other African colonies had many gods and poor administrations. With the church monopoly on education, the people were rapidly converted. The Belgian colonial powers and the church ruled through the Tutsis. The elite who had long ruled over the actual majority, the Hutus. The Tutsis retained many privileges. Some received higher education. But this led to thoughts of independence. Tension arose between the church and the Tutsis. As independence spread in Africa, the Tutsis turned to the east and contacted African revolutionary leaders. He had to go Paris, 
They were talking about communism. But communism was taboo in Rwanda. It was anti-Christian. Pope Pius XI had already condemned communism. Christian Democratic Belgium and the Catholic Church would lose power if the independent Rwanda became communist. They switched sides, now supporting the West-friendly Hutu majority. The Hutu leaders didn't miss the chance to encourage ethnic tension by pointing out the former Tutsi privileges and encouraging revolt. So the Tutsis wanted independence from the Catholic Church and the stirs the Vatican to turns against the Tutsis. And notice the Tutsis are now called communists just because they wanted to be separate from the Roman Catholic Church. One Hutu wow. leader and later president during the genocide was Theodore Sindikubabu. Starting in the 1950s, people started expressing their discontent. Then around 55, 56, the Hutu people, some of the educated Hutsis, started to write the Hutus, complaining about the bad leadership, the oppression. The leadership of the few was oppressing the many. Hutu farmers listened, they revolted, and a West-friendly coup was staged in 1959. A Christian Democratic Party was formed. European Christian Democrats saw this as a step towards democracy and supported a new leadership. Belgium and other Christian Democrat-run countries, like Germany, assisted the First Republic to great extent to stabilize the gains of the revolution. And that social revolution largely corresponded to the priorities and views of the Christian Democratic International. But the Rwandan Christian Democratic Party was not democratic. The country was ruled not by the democratic majority, but by the ethnic majority, the Hutus. The vast majority of the Hutu people saw Rwanda as their country. They voiced their concerns in the pamphlet called the Hutu Manifesto. Many Tutsis were killed in the takeover and tens of thousands fled north into Uganda. The exiled Tutsis organized a guerrilla army in order to try to retake power and property. Archbishop André Perodin had influence even in the new regime. He saw the guerrilla as a communist threat to the ideal Christian state and equated them with Satan. Communism is active. Satan exists, he says. That was the comparison. The Hutu is Catholic. The Tutsi is communist. They were called cockroaches, small troops of soldiers. They tried to attack and take back their power, but they didn't succeed. Thousands of Tutsis were killed in retaliation. The regime, backed by the Belgian military, used religion as a tool. It cited the description of Tutsis as anti-Christian communists, adding that they were a race that God wanted driven out. So now the Tutsis were separated from the Roman Catholic rule, were labeled as communists, satanic, and cockroaches. So we now see a, quote, media campaign against the Tutsis. President Javier Mana was very religious, as was the Belgian king. The two heads of state became good friends. Javier Mana's regime became increasingly fundamentalistic. The church was integrated into the government. Priests managed party affairs on all levels. And the archbishop was a member of the party's central committee. What can you say about this brand of Christianity? It was compulsory. To go to school, you had to be baptized. The children weren't free. 
to get an education, you needed to be baptized. To get into the system the church had created, even the financial part, you had to be a Christian. The Christian Democrats in Brussels appreciated the strong Christian influence and that the regime was anti-communist. The Christian Democratic Party took over, tolerating no opposition. Citizens were required by law to be party members. Prisons were filled. It was illegal to belong to a group that questioned the church involvement in the government. Could that happen in America? Those who protested were imprisoned. You had to be a member of the, quote, Christian party by law. You were not allowed to question in the church's role in government. You were punished if you did. And you're starting to see an example here of what Revelation 13 tells us is going to happen not far from now when the papacy, the fallen, pre and everyone else, this could come to America. Mr. Wilfred Martins was the man behind Europe's Christian democratic politics. He was vice president of the Christian Democratic International during the genocide. He, too, supported Rwanda's leaders. This is not Christianity, folks. President Habyarimana's power increased with international support. France, too, supported the regime to gain local influence, but the exploding population was starving, and the tiny elite had confiscated over half of the country's resources. The Catholic Church, tempted by its new power, had done the same. It owned much of the richest land. But the Habyarimana regime chose to use religion to control the people. When the Pope visited Rwanda in September 1990, it was one of Habyarimana's biggest propaganda victories. If Rwanda really was an attempt to create the kingdom of God on earth, it, its enemies must be the devil. This was the ideology that we, we, we were taught they said, our country is under attack. We must all fight for our country. I'm watching the war take place there. They're marching. Lord, they get all this military weaponry. Wow. The war started, and the guerrillas started advancing, capturing land. We were getting tired and losing the war. Young men didn't want to be soldiers anymore. Some areas went over to the guerrilla, others remained loyal. When the attack began in October 1990, Habyarmana flew to his friends in Brussels. He was granted an audience with the king. The king wrote to Prime Minister Wilfred Martens who immediately received Habyarimana. Before the day was over, Belgian troops were heading for Kigali. But Habyarimana realized that a conventional military victory against a well-equipped guerrilla was impossible. So the party formed a militia that would become the backbone of the genocide. The youth organization of the Christian Democratic Party was called Intrahamve, We Who Fight Together. Interwau answered the, to the party and consisted of both men and women. The citizens were asked to monitor their sectors and their land. They organized patrols to see what came and went. Rwanda was militarized. The youth militia was trained by the military, police, and the politicians. Habyarimana ordered businessmen to equip them. I asked the National Secretariat, I asked the Secretary General to talk to businessmen in order to get the means to equip into our way. But they didn't just provide clothes. The businessman Felician Kabuga imported machetes. The violence against the Tutsis escalated. Terrorism occurred openly. 
often after inflammatory party meetings. Soon, human rights organizations reported genuine massacres. The United Nations was also concerned and forced the regime to negotiate peace with the Tutsi guerrilla RPF in Arusha, Tanzania. With international support, the disaster might have been avoided. But the Christian Democratic International advised the regime not to sign any agreement of power sharing. The Tutsi guerrilla were still perceived as communists. Negotiating with the RPF is indefensible. It was about protecting God's work from the forces of evil. The propaganda became increasingly religious. The regime-friendly press printed the Hutu Ten Commandments, which encouraged persecution of Tutsis in all parts of society. One paper rejected talk about love and unity in a dialogue between Mary, Jesus and Joseph. <laughs> Javier Emana was portrayed in a bishop dress. The church also participated, describing the Tutsis as cursed by God. Good old Catholic Church. The Bible was often quoted in media and political speeches. One of the most well-known speeches was made by party leader Leon Mugesera on the radio. We should work to exterminate these tramps. As the Bible says, if a snake comes to bite you, you don't let him do it. You will be exterminated if he does. Now, now psychologically, the Tutsi is a serpent. How can he live? You must kill him or be killed. It's self-defense. A few months before the genocide, a youth leader left in Trahambe and informed the world that the genocide was being planned. We find dozens of evidence in the archives from the foreign minister in Belgium. And this archives shows very clearly that uh, not only Belgium had this information, but that this information was shared with the United Nations, the U.S. and, and France. None of the informed countries acted. On April 6, as he returned to Kigali, Javier Amana's plane was shot down. Everyone on board was killed. Just hours later, the most time-efficient genocide in history began. Wow, I'm just watching. These pictures are horrific. Just dead bodies lined all over the streets. These Tutsi terrorists will exterminate. We will exterminate with our weapons. God has prepared hell for them. Just looking at people laying in the streets one after the other. Oh, my God. Little children. And the Vatican condoned it. In fact, it helped... Organize it. Put it all together using biblical, wow, principles. Boy, they'll do anything, won't they? Now, think about it, folks. You think they're going to do any? You think they're going to spare you here if you're a Bible-believing Christian? Oh boy, skull after skull after skull. And people have only seen this 26 times. No wonder, you know, Everywhere, they've stopped it. Were murdered. Killing came to be called work. We went into a house. There were six people there. I killed one person. The others killed the rest. Mom held us tight. She held us so tight because she wanted us to all die together. Once the order was given, it was the fastest execution you ever saw. I dream, this little kid saying this, I dream someone is hunting me. Sometime I dream of my mom and dad. It's a little kid talking. All Tutsis were to be killed. Not even babies were spared. No one must be left. 
During the three months genocide, the church supported the regime. Rwanda's Catholic bishops wrote a document promising to obey and support the new president and his regime. Boy, that says it all. The Catholic bishops rejoice in the new government, it says in their paper, and promise it their support. They honor the armed forces of Rwanda. Many of the country's priests and nuns helped kill Tutsis. So, the Roman Catholic Church Babylon, along with the fallen Protestant Church's Daughters of Babylon, not only support the huge massacre, but Christian helped Democrats in the killing. Brussels also supported the regime. Even in June, documents encouraged Europe's Christian Democrats to continue supporting their friends in Rwanda. Christian Democrats should help the Rwandan friends. But listen, there's only about a minute left. I think we got the point here of the Vatican involvement. Now, they were asked to apologize. I, I've heard that uh, there's been uh, reports that Pope Francis has apologized. I'd like to listen to that. So anyway, apologies not accepted, Pope, Mr. Pope, not accepted. You kill millions of people, then you say, oh, I'm sorry. Folks, it could happen here. Think about it. 26 views on this video. It's unbelievable. Back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.